I am back, and you are comfortably zoned with me, the Zigzag Man, in Alameda, California, across the bay from San Francisco, and down by the lagoon at the 420 Studio. And we're having a good day. The sun is shining. I got to go for a walk with my tally today. She's not working. And uh, I dug something out that you guys might really enjoy. I had, A couple of weeks ago, I did a tribute to the late Yogi Berra. I did a series of three shows, and um, I've got one more for you. And um, Charlie Silvera was his backup catcher um, in the first in the first, what I call the first dynasty the Yankees had uh, in Bearer's Day in, from 1949 to 1953. Uh, they won five consecutive World Series. And uh, Charlie didn't play very much, but he cashed a lot of World Series checks. And in 1995, I was doing a cable sports talk show for Cal State Hayward. Um, Charlie was one of my guests. And um, I thought I'd play this interview for you. I dug it out of the archives, and uh, it comes replete with um, lead-in music for the show, Sports from the Top of the Hill. So let's see if I can get this uh, sucker going, and uh, we might have a show. Let's see what happens. Then, yeah, I'll take it up for a while. Take it up in Charlie the mid, Silvera. mid thing. Hey, Charlie Ralph, Silvera. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, well. uh, I, I played a year with the Cubs. 57 was uh, a year that I, I was sold uh, by the Yankees to the Cubs in the uh, winter of 56. In fact, I was living in New York, and uh, I was home, and a fellow from 42nd and Broadway, a friend of mine, had one of those hot shops down there. Hey, you just been sold to the Cubs. They didn't have the courtesy to... Uh, Call me. To call you. That's no. some nice work. Well, anyway, it was so, great. Now I, I, I was there with the best, with oh, the best of times. Oh, you had some wonderful years. Um, right. There's a recent book that came out that cited the 12 players that played from 1949 to 1953 when the Yankees won five consecutive world champions. Right. Uh, tremendous years, and you were one of those players. Um, Mickey wasn't. Mickey came in. No, he came in 51. 51. You were telling me he was your roommate. Yeah, that. briefly. Uh, in 51, they, uh, my roommate Joe Collins had, uh, had a bad, bad leg, so they had me room with Mickey. So I was a uh, sort of a veteran then, and he's a good guy. And we still, we're still the best of friends and uh, had a lot of fun with him. That's wonderful. Um, the biggest point in your career basically was the transition between the days of Joe McCarthy Casey Stengel. Um, not the biggest point in your career necessarily, but a very significant point in Yankee history. Well, yes, it was for a lot of players. Of course, I, I was in spring training with the Yankees in 56 and did play for uh, Joe McCarthy, and he was a, a very astute man, a great, a great manager, and I learned a lot from him. In fact, one of the best advice, pieces of advice I ever got was uh, he said, uh, young man, he said, are you married? I said, no, sir, you got a girlfriend? No, sir, that's 1950-46, so he said, well, Make sure you know what you're going to do in this game before you get married. And I did. I waited until I got to the big leagues and then got married. It was Joe McCarthy's. Joe name. McCarthy. Right. Tell me about Casey Stengel a little bit. Well, of course, I had played against Casey Stengel out here when uh, he was with Oakland, and I was with Portland. This is 47, yeah. 48. And uh, uh, my manager was Jim Turner, who uh, ended up being the pitching coach. And uh, I had some good series against Casey. And, uh, of course, now people say, well, what kind of a guy was Casey? So I says, uh, what about that Stengelese? I said, well, the first real conversation that I listened to was I asked him if I could take my wife back to New York and if I was going to make the club. This was in 49. You, couldn't, you didn't bring your wife to, uh, in, to spring training if, if you weren't sure of making the club or hadn't played there the year before. So anyway, so Turner says, go talk to Casey. Well, I listened to Kim and the Stengelese for, let's say, 10, 15 minutes, and I went back to, to Jim Turner. I said, Jim, I don't know what he said. He says, well, he didn't say yes or no, but he, all he did was talk. He says, well, he said, bring her back. I think he got the club made. And I, she came back, and I stayed for 
for uh, nine glorious years, uh, seven uh, pennants. In fact, my wife, first five years in baseball, we won five consecutive championships. Right. And then in 54, she was wondering where the big check was after we finished second right. in Cleveland. My Giants at that time won the pennant. Well, I didn't, you won over 100 games as a Yankee. We won 103 and lost. And, and lost by eight. That's the only time Stengel ever won 100 games. We lost by eight. Cleveland had a tremendous year that year. Just the pitching, basically, or well, they, did, they had they had career years from a lot of players. Roberto Av uh, Avila had uh, Avila had won the yeah. batting championship. Now Rhodes had a tremendous year, but they were a good ball club. But tremendous pitching staff. They got all that year. My goodness, outstanding. Yeah. What are some of the misconceptions that people carry on through the years of those Yankee teams? How is the public I'm not fooled, but um, what are some of the things that you know that they don't know? Just well, the well, with the Yankees, well, we we were we were a close knit outfit, and uh, and the first thing when he told a rookie we had fellows like Sternwise, Henrik, John, Billy Johnson, and Lindell, they'd say, "Well, now, kid, you're up here, you don't mess with our money. We and and it's, there's no tomorrow. You win today." He said, "Don't say we get them tomorrow. You win today," and and more or less we pleased. They pleased us. Well, you know, you're out here to win, right. and uh, there's only there's only one thing, and that's first place. And as people became veterans, they passed that on. In other well, words. certainly, and I was a veteran. I I would we would place uh, we would have a we would call a meeting. I remember Jerry Cohen was our player rep, and we would uh, say uh, he would get up there and say, "Well, we got to get get together and have a, a little settee here, and then get these guys straightened out." And he'd say, "Well, we don't want anybody." We don't want to lose this pen of, uh, over the bar or what, anybody out with some young lady or something. And then point fingers at some of the younger guys, you know. And if uh, you were out late, so-and-so, you know, boy, they didn't, and from then on, it was no contest. How did the Yankees adjust to losing DiMaggio's leadership? Did Casey come in and um, kind of take over the team at that point? Uh, Casey was, uh, in, it's in that book here, that he was smart enough to... Uh, let things roll a little bit, and uh, 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 he knew that there was the people that played with for McCarthy, and uh, and of course Casey didn't have that great reputation uh, as uh, a major league not manager, in a winner not, in the, not in the major league, no. And so he he just uh, and his platooning that didn't make a lot of people happy. Right. He and, always had uh, somebody mad at him. Oh yeah, surely, and then. But, uh, uh, that's that's one of the things he really had to cope with, and I think he did a tremendous job. He used to say, "After we had won a few pennants, he said, yeah, you guys might not me might might, uh, might not like me very well now, but when you get your World Series check, you might like me a little more." Right, and, and that was true. And they did. And then they and did. And, back. And, and I think looking back now, if you go to an old timer game, we talk about it, and uh, the players would say, "Well, you know, he wouldn't." Have very uh, dumb guy after all. He was pretty smart, wasn't he? He did get a lot out of players like Woodland and Bowers. Well, I know he always had them mad. Uh, and, of course, he played with three first basemen. With, he had Collins and Mize and, and even yeah. Johnny Hopp one year. And uh, and, uh, and, and, they, uh, and then he hit against different uh, pitchers in different towns. And uh, so he Did played. it always make sense what he did? No, a lot of times. I remember one time was, uh, in, in Detroit uh, uh, with uh, Jackie Jensen had hit the two home runs, and uh, he took him out for a pinch hitter. The next time he said, well, it's, it's, it's the law, the law is against the uh, average is against uh, Jensen hitting three home runs, and I think Cliff Mace came in and, uh, you know, pinch hit for him, hit a home run, stuff like that. He had yeah, a lot of hunches. He played some hunches. I digress a second. Let's talk about Jackie Mason. Jackie Mason was a Cal star. Jackie Jensen. Jackie, Jackie Jensen. No. Jackie, Jackie <laughs> wasn't a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie Mason. Did I say that? Did not. That's all right. This is our natural. Jackie, Jackie Jensen. Jensen. Tremendous. Came up a Yankee, isn't it? Right. He played at Oakland here and came up with Billy Martin in 1950. And I got to be real friendly with uh, Jackie. In fact, uh, I used to babysit his uh, uh, first daughter, Jan. And he'd go out with Joe, uh, and uh, the four of us would go out a lot of time, get a babysitter, and I got to be very friendly. In fact, when Jackie was coaching here, mm -hmm. he used to ask me over to help work with, to help him with his catchers. Over oh, town. Never forgot. And Jackie was one tremendous person. I know he hadn't run into, ran into problems yeah. with that cow. But what an athlete. Oh, tremendous. 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 Yeah, one of the best athletes I've ever seen. Okay. 
which brings us to the rich Yankee farm system in those days. And you were a catcher, and some of the catchers that came up in those days, Sherm Lawler, Gus Triandis, these were all-stars in the American League for years and years, and they played behind Yogi, Yogi. And, and Ellie as... And Hauk was the third. Ralph Hauk? Ralph uh, Hauk. One year, I guess it was 50, maybe three, let's say 53, um, yeah, they had Lou Berberettler was the uh, MVP in the, at the, at the, in the Eastern League. Elson Howard was the MVP in the uh, 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 International League. Lou Berberettler. Lou Berberettler and Triandis. He went on to Washington. And, and, Hal Smith. Smith. and Hal Smith. There were four of them, and, and they came, all came to spring training, and, and none of them made the team because uh, Yogi naturally is going to start, and they, could, they couldn't have anybody sitting around. So they went out and played uh, maybe another year in the minor league or were traded to other clubs for uh, needed pitching help. Well, with Baltimore, Curly and Larson as, uh, as uh, Good example. when Hal Smith went over there, right. Triandis. Triandis went there and uh, Sherm Lawler. Yeah. Sherm Lawler had, had gone right, to right. the St. Louis Browns. Right. I took Sherm Lawler's place. with Les Moss, as a matter of fact. Right. What a yeah. great guy. All right. I took Sherm Lawler's place. I wore his, his uniform number. But it's in that book uh, about how many what we call yogi yogi rejects. We're not selling the book, but it, it, well, let's put it up there. It's a good All book. Right, there's the book. It's called The October Twelve. It's about the twelve of us that were on the five consecutive World Championship Club, and in fact, there was only eight of us that were there for every day. Uh, Joe, Joe Collins was recalled in '49. Mice came over from the Giants, and of course, Jerry and uh, Coleman and Bobby Brown. I had to go uh, uh, back to the uh, it, for service during the Korean War, okay. but I'm sure they'd have, they'd have been there. You started out your first year after your first year in baseball. You went into the service yourself. You spent three years. I spent three service. years in the service. I Jerry Coleman and I broke in together. And, uh, we're both from San Francisco, both natives, and uh, we went back to Wells, New York, in the Pony League uh, with another fellow by the name of Bob Jerry. We had 17 going across country, and it was great. Came back. Uh, I went in the service, and uh, uh, and then I'm playing with DiMaggio and uh, Red Ruffing. And, uh, uh, did the service prepare you for any of that? Well, it did. I, you know, it was, uh, it was wartime, and, but we were ball players, so we played ball. And uh, But prepare me, my goodness, like I say, here I'm playing with major leaguers after only three months of minor league ball. Uh, and the shirt prepared me, prepared me for baseball, prepared me for life. Well, you know, got to got to know meet people from all over, and I then I would look at other people and say, uh, uh, other, other catchers in the service, and say that fellow played in the big leagues. Boy, well, I, I can thing. play in the big leagues. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I'm better than he is, and uh, that because, prepared me. I, I say, I'm going to make it. Yeah. We're talking to a man who played behind Yogi Berra for what eight, nine, eight. Yeah, years. eight, nine years actually. Uh, these eight other and a catch, half. these other catchers are going on. Some of them tremendous careers. Lalo had a wonderful oh, Lawler career. Lalo and all of Triandos with uh, Coach Smith. Right. Berberet. Now, you were making the World Series money, and you were able to sit and not let your ego get involved. You didn't complain. You weren't a bellyacher. No. Um, no. Well, it was When you played, you played very effective. The only time you ever got more than 100 at bats. My, my first full year, yeah, yeah, it was in 49. But uh, after the first couple of uh, World Series, and, uh, I said, this isn't bad. And, uh, you know, so That's a great attitude. Well, you were with New York. You were with the winner. Uh, when you were sold to uh, to another ball club by the Yankees, you went to a second division club. You never went to a, a contender in the American League, and they, they, or else they got you out of the league or made a deal. Well, I was always figuring I was going to be in a deal, but I, I was the perfect uh, backup for Yogi because uh, – uh, I, I was a single hitter. I hit for pretty good average, and I could uh, play uh, catch and throw. And uh, but I was there. That's just, and, and I realized when other players that come up and says, you know, they're all their ego. I I want to play first string. Well, my goodness, who's going to take Yogi's job? So they say, well, you're a pretty smart guy hanging around there. And I said, well, I said I I, I realized I was in a pretty good spot. You saw Campanello a lot in the World Series. Great. Could you assess the two, Yogi Campy? Um, uh, well, let's see. Campy, they, they were pretty much alike. You come down, you know, Yogi doesn't get the credit that he should. Be, uh, he he exactly. didn't want to catch. That's one of the reasons that I was recalled because he was playing the outfield, and I was recalled in '48. And uh, and but uh, Dickie came along and 
he said, well, you're going you're gonna to be a catcher, and that's it. You've got the job. And he got this confidence. That's all he lacked. But it was with him and uh, Campy, uh, Campy doesn't get credit for his uh, – he was a good defensive catcher. So was Yogi. Yogi's an adequate thrower, maybe a little better than adequate. Of course, he had power in Yankee Stadium. Campy was up in Brooklyn. Uh, they were both leaders. Uh, they, not, what Yogi would interrupt. Uh, our, our, our meetings about certain hitters, and he'd say, well, you can't pitch this guy high anymore. you got to pitch him low. He's looking for that ball. So Yogi knew what Yogi was going was on. Yogi was one smart man. You're he back. was portrayed as no. this buffoon that Garagiola has him no, portrayed he as. He was no uh, buffoon. He, he didn't have much schoolhouse, we used to say, but, boy, he knows what, what's going on. He could tell yeah. you who the roller derby champion was in 1940. He was a great man. He's still one of my closest friends. And we enjoyed ourselves. That's, the, that's what the camaraderie was. You know, I wouldn't. I used to kid him. I said, you had to play hard because you saw me sitting there in a bullpen. And he laughed. But this is, we like to say, the club, uh, I, uh, we were talking about it the other day with, with some people. We never had, now they're fighting among themselves. Uh, we never had any physical, uh, really, well, people to shout at each other. When you're together for six, seven months, right. you know, we used to see oh, uh, players walking around with more than we saw our wives. Right. And 25 <laughs> egos yes. of some real superstars. Tell me about that pitching staff. Well, uh, Rashi. Rashi Reynolds, Lopat, naturally. And, and then Whitey Ford. Whitey came Ford came along. But people and you say, saw and caught these guys in right. the bullpen every day of your baseball exactly. life uh -huh. for eight, eight years. And, of course, Whitey's in the Hall of Fame. Right. But uh, I, I've always said in, uh, in, a, in a, I think, the summer of 49, I meant uh, the, the book uh, Halberstam wrote, but they should put those three pitchers, Rashi, Reynolds, and Lopat, in the Hall of Fame as an entry. Like, you know, the, like right. the horses, 1A, right, exactly. well, they put them in 1A, B, and C. Put them in there. They yeah. deserve it. Look at their record over those three years. My goodness, 700% seven, seven, or more. But because they weren't around uh, too long, they didn't win enough games, they're not in there. Right. Why can't you put and them? And their careers were shortened by the service. By the well. service, surely. So that's changed an awful yeah, lot. So when you look at career numbers back then, yeah. Um, DiMaggio lost years and years. Three, Ted Williams Ted lost Williams. Year. That's right. Yes. Tell me about Ted Williams, a visitor that came into Yankee Stadium. Well, he was uh, he was he was feared uh, more more so in Yankee Stadium in Boston because uh, that's the closest. Course. But you could pitch around him a little bit in Yankee Stadium because of most of their power was right-handed. See, uh -huh. and but Ted uh, he was there. Boy, I'll tell you, he, he was something else. In fact, I tell the Ted Williams story with. Uh, uh, Bill McGowan, they call him number one in the umpire. We're pitching. I'm catching in Boston. Ted's hitting, and and uh, I thought he had him. I thought he had him. Uh, we had him struck out the night. Said, Gee whiz, Mac! He never turned around to McGowan, any umpire. Then he says, uh, "That was a pretty good pitch." He says, "Throw the ball back, you Bush SB." He says, "They came to see him hit, not you catch." <laughs> but he was. Uh, you could hear him on the on deck grinding that bat, you know. And if you backed up first base. And you came back, you know, and there he was. He's, he's in the box already. He, let's go. He's waiting. He's waiting. He's waiting to hit. Yeah. And you're Brooklyn you're people. You know, I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're, I don't know, you, you were Yankee I was from, fan. I was a Giant fan. Oh, Giant. That's Giant fan. That's so we used to play the Dodgers. We'd play them. Uh, Every year. Well, except yeah, the one year you played the but Giants, not only that, but we, the Giants. But we would play them, uh, we would play them uh, uh, two or three times uh, in, in Florida. Then three, three times. Uh, before the season started. Right. And so then we play them in the Marist Trophy game. So we would play uh, the Dodgers uh, almost about three quarters of, uh, of the game that we played all the other American League clubs. You didn't play the Giants much because they trained. No, they trained in Arizona. Right. Yeah. But, um, you know, the trade that never came off, and I think about that a lot, is the um, the Ted Williams DiMaggio. for Joe DiMaggio. Yeah, well, how would that affect uh, each one? Yeah. I mean, how do you think things would have changed? It, you know, it's hard to say. I, I think they'd have both. They would both say, well, whatever. I think I'm sure Ted would have hit more in in uh, in, in Yankee Stadium, and, and Joe would have hit more home runs in 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 the Boston. Because uh, left field in, in Yankee Stadium was just oh, well, I used to call it what uh, uh, the Mojave Desert or what, uh, what they had a name for it. I can't remember. I didn't worry about. I had no power, so I didn't worry about hitting them out there. So no, I think. Uh, they both would have ended up great. Yeah, I guess it wasn't. They had talked about it, Gawky, and uh, topping, I guess, you know, earlier.
tell me about Billy Martin. You spent a lot of years with Billy. You were his coach later on when he I room with him. Uh, yeah, I room with him, and uh, he was with Oakland when I was with Portland out here. And then when we came to the Yankees in '50, he wasn't married, and uh, my wife was expecting our first child, and she hadn't come to New York yet. And then the three of us, uh, well, well, Hank Bauer was the other. Hank was playing. Billy and I weren't playing, but he, we would talk and say, "Well, if Billy would say if I ever manage the Oaks, meaning." Right. Oakland. Not even thinking about the majors coming here. Just thinking about the Oaks or those. And I managed the Seals. You'll be my coach, and vice versa. And by God, and when he got the job at the Minnesota, after he cleared up the problems he had with the uh, belting Brewer and breaking his jaw, when he got the job. He, he called me, and that's so that was. Uh, well, let's see, that was '69. So we're talking about 19 years after he made that promise. And he's, I still I have that promise with my friend Len. Len, if I ever manage the Giants or the Mets, you're my bench coach. Yeah. So that's no. <laughs> he, he, he's loyal. Uh, you know, Billy is. Mm-hmm. Billy had his problems, like all of us did, but he's loyal. And you hear all well, you hear bad things about it, but uh, Billy, nobody can say anything bad about Billy around me. You were his coach in Minnesota. Minnesota, uh, Detroit, and Texas. Okay. And then when he got, he got helped me get the job at the Yankees and uh, and uh, with Oakland, I was with Oakland too. And uh, wherever he went, I, he got fired. and I got fired a minute later, but he uh, I got hired a lot too. You got hired a lot. That was the no, good news. He, he, he never went on to coach in Yankee Stadium. Did you? No, no, I had because I had taken my pension after he got let go at, at uh, Texas, and uh, he never really he wanted a younger fellow. I was getting a little too old. Of every day grind throwing. Were you here for Billy Ball? I was here. I was working for Billy then. I was okay. in, I was what, a what they minor league laughing. catching instructor. Oh, yeah, okay. I was here. Yeah. So did you work with Marv Grissom at all? Uh, uh, yeah, in spring that. training. He was only there to one year. Marv didn't really uh, care. I guess he didn't like being away from home after all the years. He had you know, been not, not, not doing that. No, but uh, well, we had a good family. Billy taught the people here how to, how to win. Right. And... and um, there's the theory that he might have overused some of the pictures in those days. Well, yeah, they talk about that, and uh, I was there, but uh, uh, I don't remember ever, any of them having getting sore arms at the end of the year. Uh, it seemed sore arms popped up the next year, but uh, my, they pitched a lot of innings. But uh, my goodness, uh, look at the they were there in a five man rotation then, I think. Uh, my, how about the four man uh, four man rotation and all of the guys pitching 300 innings? Right. How about the, uh, How about the guys that pitched 300 innings, Warren Spahn, year after year after year, and we never heard? Now think about this. <laughs> Nobody had ever heard anybody say anything about the guys in the bullpen warming up day after day. Don't you think that that uh, catches their arm? Yeah. But they're throwing. But, uh, but there's been a lot of controversy in that, and uh, maybe some of it had to do with that, but I don't think all of it had to do with that. Uh, he got them big, big, big salaries. That's for sure. Billy went first class. They won. they won. Billy upgraded the scouting too. Uh, when another scout, we were making twice as much as any scout in baseball. Tell me about that. You spent the last twenty some odd years of your career scouting. Well, I don't know if I've been. Yeah, I was a scout after I got through playing and managing the Yankee chain. I I, um, I scouted for uh, I scouted eight, uh, eight years with Washington Senators. Oh, I remember. Oh yeah. Then I went back as a coach for Billy, and then I went back uh, with the Atlanta Braves, and I scouted for the Braves. And for uh, Milwaukee, and three years with the Yankees, and uh, my goodness, so I mean, I don't know, I've got over 25 years scouting. How has scouting changed since the free agent system that came in 1965? You mean the, dra- uh, the, the draft. draft? Oh, right. it, it trained tremendously because uh, you used to be able to zero in and three, four, five guys, sit with them, get to know them, uh, maybe buy them a glove, a pair of shoes. Um, but now uh, the, the, the personal scouting, uh, getting co- in contact with the player and his family, doesn't do any good anymore because you don't know whether you're going to get him in the draft or not. How, that's hurt baseball though, because you're bringing people in that you really don't know into the baseball system that you really don't know much about or as much about as before. Yeah, I think that the scouting now is tougher because you have to uh, uh, get all these names down to say, "I have 20 names." That, People you want to uh, how high you rank how you rank them and everything else, and uh, and you got to do a lot more. You got to go in and give my test and stuff like that and find out a lot more things. The money is always involved too. They want this and that, and 
uh, uh, so that get, that gets too deeply involved. If you had, if you you're, the, the people you sold yourself and your organization, you sold yourself a lot. You've had all these years in baseball. Would you do anything differently? No, not a thing. I I, I feel that I'm the most fortunate man that ever lived playing. Playing in New York, playing uh, uh, behind a Hall of Famer, and being a member of seven world, uh, seven pennant winners, and six world championship clubs. My goodness, how can anybody ask for any more than that? Nice interview, Charlie. Thank you. All right, my man. pleasure. All right, thank you. Whoa, you are comfortably zoned, and that was 20 years ago when I did that interview. That was Charlie Silvera former New York Yankee, and um, Charlie's still with us, but uh, I don't think he's ever done a better interview, I'll tell you that, Um, that was trippy, I listened to that, like I say, I um, hadn't heard it in a long, long time, and I enjoyed it myself, and um, what can I tell you, one of the good ones, Charlie Silvera, New York Yankees. Um, number 29, Charlie Silvera, number 29, uh, that was the voice of the Yankees, imitated by me, the zigzag man, and I'm going to close it before I make a total fool out of myself, um, by saying this, I implore you, my listening audience, uh, Charlie, you're still around, you're 90, I implore you to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, Keep your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics that wear dresses, just to be on the safe side. Adios, amigos and amigas.